on with um, introducing Maria, um, whose paper is of course in, in early view on conservation letters. Um, so it is my great pleasure to introduce you then today to Dr. Maria Milicic. Maria is a research associate working at the Biosense Institute, Research Institute for Information Technologies in Biosystems, University of Novi Sad in Serbia. In 2017, she obtained a PhD in ecology in the Faculty of Sciences at the University of Novi Sad. Her research activities are primarily focused towards the conservation of a significant insect pollinator group, hoverflies. Maria is particularly interested in the ecology, functional diversity, and the effects of different environmental pressures, such as intensive agriculture and climate change on the distribution of these species. She's a member of the advisory committee of the IUCN International Union uh, of the IUCN um, Hoverfly Specialist Group. Um, she's actively working on the European Red List of Hoverflies, which is soon to be pu published. Maria is also an associate researcher in the Laboratory for Integrative Biodiversity Research based in the Natural History Museum in Helsinki, where she conducted a part of her research towards her PhD. And today, Maria will be presenting insect threats and conservation through the lens of global experts, as is currently av available in conservation letters. With that, Maria, over to you. Uh, thank you, Martin. Good morning to everyone. Uh, it's very nice to be here and I'm happy to present uh, our recently published paper. I hope that you will find uh, our, uh, our paper interesting and of course, uh, after my talk, uh, you are more than welcome to ask any questions. So, uh, just to see how to... Ah, okay. So uh, I would start uh, by shortly presenting uh, the authors behind this research. So next to myself, uh, you already heard something about me. Uh, three more people participated in this study. Uh, those are uh, my colleagues Snežana Popov from University of Novi Sad and two of my colleagues from um, University of Helsinki from Natural History Museum. Those are uh, Vasco Branco and Pedro Cardoso. So uh, our, uh, our paper is now actually um, published in, in the regular issue. So you can find it um, on the web page of uh, Conservation Letters. So uh, when I was thinking about how to start this presentation, my first thought was, there is no need to go in details about insects, people know that, etc. But then I actually realized that uh, we tend to forget this stuff. And it's not bad uh, to, recap to recapitulate from time to time. So I would start, if I manage to switch the slide, okay. So, uh, I would start uh, with uh, introducing a couple of facts about insects which probably most of you know, but it's not bad to hear them again. So insects are the most diverse group of insect or of um, eukaryotic organisms on the planet. Uh, this means that the number of insect species is more than any other group. Uh, so far, there is around 1 million of described, described species or a bit more, but estimations on how many species actually exist uh, go far beyond these numbers. So based on some more conservative estimations, there is around 2 million of undescribed species, but some estimations go as far as saying that there are 30 million of undescribed species. Uh, regarding the number of insect individuals, it reaches in any point of time in present 10 quintillion. So if, if, in case you're not familiar with this number, the quintillion means that there is, there is 10 and then 18 zeros behind 10. So 10 quintillion of insects, uh, insect individuals on the globe. How is this possible? These, these huge numbers uh, of both, um, both in terms of uh, biodiversity of insects, as well as uh, their, the number of individuals, uh, it's due to the several facts, um, mainly due to their long uh, geological history, the ability of insects to fly, their remarkable reproductive abilities, 
and also um, the ability uh, to store sperm for delayed fertilization and their um, general adaptive abilities to different types of the environment. So um, insects with all these advantages have also crucial roles in, the eco in different ecosystem processes and provide us with numerous irreplaceable services, many of which are critical for human survival and well-being. Yet, despite all these facts, if I manage to switch to the next slide, just a minute, yeah. Uh, most insects are perceived as non-charismatic at best and as pests as, as wor at worst. Uh, this negative perception uh, towards insects uh, is actually a major impediment to the conservation of insect biodiversity. Why is that? Because um, conservation efforts are mainly focused to the species that people find attractive. And uh, there are, of course, a few exceptions among insects as well, such as, for example, butterflies and bees which um, often capture public's attention and, and attract resources for both monitoring and conservation. But in general, uh, the, the insects are, are underestimated in this aspect. Uh, in order to reverse this ongoing worldwide decline in insect diversity, uh, there is a need to uh, mitigate or even better to completely eliminate uh, negative attitudes towards insects. But uh, as this is not bad enough for them, uh, it's also uh, noted in the recent research that uh, insects are underrepresented in the published literature. So not really uh, a good time to be an insect these days. Um, despite this, um, Neglect in the published literature, we must say that there is a recent rise in the number of papers tackling the issue of insect declines in the recent years. So um, research reporting uh, declines in uh, insect uh, diversity, abundance and biomass are being uh, conducted worldwide um, from, from the Arctic uh, to the tropics across different insect uh, orders and also from a spe spectrum of ecological guilt. And um, one particularly worrying fact um, that emerged from this research is that there is also a decline in species that were formerly common and not just the rare taxa. Uh, there is uh, one study conducted in Germany a couple of years ago, which reported a dramatic 75% decline in total insect biomass um, across 63 um, protected areas in Germany. And the publication of this and several other papers uh, which uh, tackle the, the question of insect declines uh, was uh, the stimulus for, for um, public ad outbreak uh, of, of different media headlines talking about the, the insect apocalypse, uh, which would subsequently cause uh, the entire collapse of natural ecosystems, so-called ecological Armageddon, that would result basically in, in the end of, of human civilization as we know it. So uh, one good thing in all in, in the sea of these bad things is that there is a raising public interest in this topic. So uh, what we know to what we need to know about the previous studies is that uh, even with this recent rise in the number of studies, there is still a lack of large scale studies. So. Uh, even those studies that are conducted suffer from, from both geographic and taxonomic biases. So regarding, uh, regarding uh, geographic bias, most of the studies are focused on, on the whole Arctic region. Uh, and if we take into account the fact 
that uh, around uh, 80 or even 85 percent of insects are found in the tropics and south temperate regions, um, we, we can see why this can be a problem. Uh, regarding taxonomic bias, it also it uh, also happens. Um, for example, there is a, a story about pollinators. We know that there are uh, different groups of pollinators, but these are dominantly represented, and they were target of numerous funding initiatives in the previous years, which resulted in obtaining uh, huge amounts of data for for this group. And they probably have far more data than any other insect. So uh, the combination of uh, these type of uh, these types of biases uh, can lead to false notions about the state of insect diversity, uh, as well as their global spatial distribution. So what's what's potential solution? Of course, we would need to have global monitoring programs, but until this is happen. Uh, and until we don't have um, data that are unbiased, we need to search alternative options on where to find data. So one of those uh, alternative options is to uh, take into account expert opinion. There are already um, numerous examples of usage uh, of expert opinion, which uh, fre frequently plays a fundamental role in conservation and helps in decision making processes as well as in risk assessments. And if some of you are um, um, working on the IUCN assessments, uh, particularly on vertebra invertebrates and particularly in insects, you know that um, most of them uh, are almost invariably dependent dependent most of these assessments are independent uh, are dependent on expert scientific judgment um, so uh, basically if we turn to expert knowledge uh, in order to to uh, to generate uh, additional set of data it would give us the opportunity to explore a valuable yet unconventional source of data and hopefully at least partially overcome the existing taxonomic and ge geographical biases. Uh, so finally, uh, going to the aim, particular aim of our paper, it was, uh, I, uh, our idea was to use expert opinion in order to identify the most severe threats that are causing insect declines across different regions and taxa as well as to identify the main conservation strategies that could mitigate uh, insect biodiversity loss across, across the world. So uh, a bit about um, design of the study. Uh, we, con uh, we created a Google form that contained 16 questions, which were related uh, to demographic structure of the respondents, then two questions aiming uh, to learn about biogeographic and taxonomic expertise of uh, respondents, the two questions about services and disservices that are provided by insects, and then questions related to threats that are facing insect populations, as well as their current trends, questions about conservation measures and allocation of funds, and finally, supporting information. Uh, in order to ensure as broad as geographical and taxonomical coverage as possible. Uh, we contacted around 100 entomological societies worldwide and asked them to distribute the query among uh, their members. And also uh, we, contact, uh, we manually extracted around uh, 3000 email addresses from corresponding authors uh, that published papers uh, in the last 10 years in international journals, um, the papers that contain the word insect in uh, either abstract keywords or in the title. So that was particular fun in, in, this, in this research. Um, so uh, we conducted in order to identify uh, the, pos the possible influence of both the demographic structure of the respondents, as well as biogeographic regions and taxa on the answers provided. Um, we per performed permanova analysis. 
And um, in the case that uh, one respondent uh, selected multiple regions or taxa in his, ans uh, in his or her answers, um, or that they filled a survey multiple times, which was encouraged in the case that um, the respondents considered to have expertise across different biogeographic regions and taxa, and that answers would um, differ among uh, these regions or taxa. Uh, so in, avoid, uh, in order to avoid dominance of answers coming from the same respondent, uh, we applied a weighted average uh, where the weight of each answer was divided by the number of queries uh, which respondent had filled. Uh, then um, this, this weighted average was also used uh, to overcome possible imbalances in the number of answers coming from different regions uh, or taxons. So uh, the relevant scores uh, were bootstrapped uh, in order to obtain upper and lower confidence limits. And this procedure was conducted uh, with all the data together in order uh, to get a global representation of answers, and then separately for all eight biogeographic regions and for all uh, taxa that contained more than 10 answers. So uh, uh, the remaining taxa were grouped um, under the category other. So uh, we managed to obtain in total 439 responses. And after elimination, a couple of uh, doubtful responses, we were left with uh, 429. Uh, when responses that contained uh, selections of multiple regions and taxa were fragmented, uh, we obtained a total of 753 responses. As for the demographic structure of the respondents, they were predominantly males. Um, holding a PhD, uh, researchers uh, with more than 10 years of, of experience. So uh, also uh, what I wanted to, to say here is that um, our results uh, showed that, um, that uh, education played uh, a role uh, significantly influenced the answers of our respondents. So all uh, analysis were conducted in two ways. We analyzed uh, all data together and then separately uh, data coming, uh, answers coming from respondents holding a PhD uh, versus answers from uh, respondents with all others level uh, of all other levels of education. So this, um, uh, this set of results uh, with fragmented uh, fragmented by education can be found in supplementary material of, of our paper uh, in case you want uh, to check them. They were broadly similar uh, with the responses um, when all responses were analyzed together. So as for the distribution of answers regarding biogeographic regions, there was a dominance of answers coming from the Western, Western Palearctic, followed by the Neotropical regions. And as for the orders, the, the most dominant answers uh, were, from, uh, were for Coleoptera, Lepidoptera, and Diptera. So as for the uh, threats, on this graph, uh, you can see uh, in, in this upper left corner are, uh, is a global analysis. And then here, uh, of course, separately based on biogeographic regions. So at the global level, the most relevant threats for uh, insects uh, uh, identified by our respondents were agriculture, climate change, and pollution. Uh, here we can see that the Afrotropical, um, Neotropical, uh, Western Palearctic, and Nearctic region followed the global pattern regarding the uh, three top rated uh, threats, while in the Eastern Palearctic, Indo Malayan region, Australasian, as well as Oceanian region, uh, residential and commercial development, so this, this uh, blue bar. Uh, so residential and commercial development uh, was among the top rated threats. Uh, the most noticeable difference was in, in Oceania, uh, where coextinctions co-extinctions 
uh, were marked uh, as significant threats, uh, as a significant threat next to those coinciding with the global pattern. Uh, if we look distribution of answers uh, separately uh, per taxa, we can see that for ephemeroptera, plecoptera, and trichoptera, so the so-called EPT community, natural system, modifi natural system modifications uh, were selected as the most, most relevant threat. So uh, what, is, what is the difference between our results and uh, results of similar studies? Uh, although uh, many recent research tackle the, the uh, most common threats for insects, they don't provide their scoring. Uh, so they don't score their severity. Even the Convention for Biological Diversity, uh, um, it recognizes the five more, most um, uh, serious pressures, but it's not scoring their relevance. Um, to the best of our knowledge, there is only one study that uh, has uh, scored the, uh, the threats, but it was conducted uh, for um, terrestrial and uh, marine and freshwater, both vertebrates and invertebrates, but it, it didn't analyze the insects separately. So if, even though if we compare the results of this study with our results, um, agriculture was most dominant in both cases, uh, while uh, in the case of uh, the mentioned study, uh, second, uh, second most important threat was hunting and trapping, uh, con contrary to, to, to our most, second most severe threat, which was climate change. Uh, here on, on this slide, you can see uh, answers of the respondents regarding uh, trends. So we examined uh, trends in different aspects, such as species richness, abundance, biomass, but also about a better diversity uh, in space and time, phylogenetic and functional diversity, as well as complexity of ecological networks. Um, there is, as you can see in this orange color, there is a perceived uh, decreasing trend in almost all parameters, uh, excluding excluding uh, functional and phylogenetic diversity, which was somehow to be expected to consider the number and the severity of threats that the insects are facing. Um, nevertheless, it is uh, also important to, to see that except for species richness and abundance, for all the other metrics, around one third of respondents marked unknown trends which indicates that even with this recent rise in the number of papers that are tackling insect declines, uh, this um, group uh, is still severely understudied. So uh, going to the results from uh, most prominent conservation measures, uh, again, in the upper left corner, you can see uh, global um, global answers where land management and land protection uh, were selected as the most significant conservation measures. Um, but uh, if if we follow the if we uh, check the distribution of answers uh, per bi biogeographic regions, we see that in most of the cases they follow uh, the global pattern. However, in the cases of uh, New Arctic uh, in the Malayan region and um, Eastern Palearctic, education was also listed uh, among the most prominent conservation measures. Uh, if we check uh, the answers fragmented by taxa, we can see that in Hymenoptera, Hemiptera, and Diptera, also education uh, was uh, listed as a highly important conservation measure. Um, this might be explained by the fact that uh, there are a lot of uh, species per perceived as dangerous uh, among Hymenoptera. Um, diptera, the main association for them is something um, filthy and, and disease transmission, while Hemiptera are perceived mainly as pests. So this might be the reason that education is especially needed for those groups. Uh, if we check the uh, answers regarding the allocation of funds for conservation, 
we can see that um, respondents would primar primarily focus uh, investments towards research of insect diversity as well as of uh, its monitoring. Uh, we assumed that um, a bit higher weight was placed to these um, uh, to these measures um, because we have a lot of researchers among our respondents, and this uh, confirms actually the subjective view that expert opinion sometimes brings. Uh, as for the services. Uh, we grouped services in four groups, so provisioning services, regulating, supporting, and cultural services. Among the provisioning services, uh, monitoring of habitat quality uh, was the, uh, let's say, top-rated service uh, provided by insect as well, insects as well as biocontrol. Among regulating services, uh, that was pollination. Among support, supporting services, that was nutrient cycling through saprophagy and coprophagy, while the most significant, uh, significant cultural service provided by insects uh, was, uh, uh, was that they serve as models for scientific research. Uh, as for these services, um, pest damage to agriculture and acting as invasive species were selected as the most uh, dominant these services uh, from insects. So those were our results in short. Uh, I didn't go much into details about uh, the discussion, uh, but of course we can we can uh, further uh, talk about that um, in the question section. So um, what would be some uh, some main messages to take with you after this lecture. Uh, lecture it's that we like data. We definitely need to to build a um, monitoring program at the global level uh, to monitor insect trends. And uh, until that is possible, because of course it's not happening um, over the night, we need to use alternative approaches that would compensate the lack of data that obviously exists. Uh, based on the respondents, the most significant threats to insects uh, are agriculture and climate change. Uh, but maybe one even severe, more severe uh, threat is our perception of insects and their value. So um, I really think that scientists play a crucial role in shaping the people's perception on insects. And we need to do our best to, to spread the word about uh, the significance of insects and uh, the threats that they are facing. And also to, uh, to try to, to um, tell people what's going to happen if, if we, continue to lose insect species. So one of the ways on how we can uh, try to, to spread the word among the common public is uh, to make um, our research results, um, let's say, uh, possible to understand the broader public. And um, regarding that, um, I think that one of the, the easiest way to do that is to graphically represent the results. So uh, here is an illustration provided by our colleague Jagoba, which, uh, which he created um, regard to, to be a part, to follow actually our, um, our article published in Conservation Letters, which um, summarizes our main findings actually that agriculture and climate change uh, are the most severe threats and um, that the straw of salvation for insects can be uh, land management and conservation. So in case uh, you would like to have uh, these amazing illustrations following your work as well, uh, I left Jagoba's email uh, on this slide. And uh, with this, I would conclude uh, my talk and thank you for your attention and I'm open to all of your questions. Thank you. Maria, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. You're welcome. Um, I see we do 
we we do have a couple of questions in the chat, but maybe before we go there, is there anybody who would like to unmute and maybe ask Maria a question in person to start things off? No one likes to unmute. <laughs> um, Maria, um, maybe to, to, to start off with then, um, I was wondering, you, you highlighted biases initially, and, and I was wondering what, what, what kind of biases do you expect with expert opinion? Um, is, is that something that one can quantify, do you think, or at, at least kind of flag so that one's aware of it? Mm, yes, I, I think that uh, it's inevitable to have biases in expert opinion as well. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, um, it's, uh, I think that researchers are, uh, of course, well known with the, their topic of research uh, and that uh, if they conduct their research in a proper way, they try to, uh, to gather as much as possible information about, uh, in this particular case, the, their study group. Uh, so uh, this can partially uh, eliminate the bias, but it always exists, especially in this in this matter, when we are dealing with, I can I can speak from the perspective of insects. Of course, uh, it may be different uh, when scientists are dealing with uh, vertebrate species. But uh, due to this um, inheritable lack of, of data, uh, I think that we are always struggling with that, and that we tend to to have uh, our own bias uh, towards the the uh, propagating the need for fu future research and for uh, providing uh, additional funding for conducting research. So I think that that's the main bias uh, that uh, it's, it was partially mentioned here that researchers uh, tend to, to focus uh, mainly on, on uh, providing resources, uh, providing funding for, fu for future resource. Uh, for future research, uh, I'm sorry, um, maybe in, in some that we have, uh, in the cases that we would have more data, uh, then we would uh, try to focus research towards some other aspects of conservation. But because we don't have the data, we, we focus, uh, focus uh, all our efforts towards this part. Thank you. Um, then the first question in the chat there is from Francesca Polce, and she says, thank you, Maria, for your interesting presentation. Speaking of conservation, are research and conservation are correlated? So, sorry, Martin, can, could you repeat, please? I, uh, it, I didn't hear you properly. Martin, can do you hear me? Again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it cut a bit, so I didn't uh, fully hear the question. Could you repeat, please? So there's a question from Francesca. I heard that who part. Who asks yes. whether research outputs. I, I don't hear you again. Maybe maybe I can check if it's if the question is in chat. Uh, if I'm breaking up, Maria, can you maybe have a look at the chat there? The yeah, question yeah, yeah, from yeah. Francesca. Okay, yeah, uh, okay. So uh, speaking of conservation, are research outputs and conservation outputs correlated? Okay, um, thank you, thank you for your question, Francesca. It's a very interesting question. Yes, and uh, yeah, I think that that uh, research uh, and conservation outputs are are re reciprocally uh, correlated; that they influence one one another. But um, again, okay, Maria, can you hear me again? Yeah, 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 Martin, I hear you. Do, do you hear me? Do you hear me, Martin? Martin? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I already read the question and started answering. Is that okay? Okay, yes, yes, okay. please go ahead, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, I think that there is a bias in this, uh, in this aspect as well, uh, because um, it can happen that 
for certain regions, we lack uh, published studies, but conservation, conservation efforts might be in place. So that there are examples in, in, uh, of conservation efforts, you know, for example, from Woodland Trust, trust um, uh, across the world. Uh, but uh, there is a, a lack of published studies from, from specific regions. Um, it might, the possible explanation for this is that it might be um, difficult from authors coming from, from uh, underdeveloped countries to publish in, in top rated journals, uh, but uh, these countries might have um, a very Mm -hmm. um, high levels of biodiversity as well, and then uh, conservation efforts are focused towards these countries. But the the publishing of of uh, researches research from these countries is lacking. Uh, I hope that I managed to answer the question of Francesca. If if I wasn't clear, please. <laughs> Thank you. There's, there's also another question from Anna Isakova, um, who asks, are other forms of conservation literature, such as modern textbooks, following the same pattern as scientific journals and articles? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, yeah, I think that, um, of course, there is, a, there is a relation between published literature uh, scientific literature and uh, those uh, facts that are published in, in uh, modern textbooks that are used in the field of conservation. Uh, but uh, I recently uh, saw a paper uh, that actually uh, says that uh, there is, again, there is a bias here. Again, if, if we observe the number of it's similar a lot like in research, um, it's unequally represented. If we take into consideration the number of uh, vertebrate or, and invertebrate species, uh, they are far more represent, uh, vertebrates are far more represented in, in scientific research. Also in, in, this, uh, in modern textbooks, it happens that, uh, that um, there are more examples on vertebrate species. Uh, and also um, something that is, um, maybe worth highlighting is that in these uh, textbooks uh, we often uh, see um, ne more negative examples uh, than the positive ones and which in my opinion might be good to change uh, because we should be uh, we should be guided by follow following good examples so maybe uh, it would be worth uh, increasing the number of good examples in textbooks. Uh, it's also um, very, very important to, to have proper textbooks on uh, conservation because they are shaping the future, future scientists and researchers. Yeah. So Maria, I've got another question for you. Um, mm -hmm. I think you made a great effort to get global responses. Um, sometimes when one sees so-called global reviews and then they almost lack um, inputs on a continental scale, like you know, from Africa, there's maybe one data set contributing or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so your coverage is quite, is, is quite good, I think, um, is my perception. Um, but are there specific areas where you really feel that your findings could have been strengthened by having input from particular, more input from particular regions? Yeah, yeah, I could, if I go back to this, um, sorry, just shortly going back to this uh, slide with presentation of the number of answers, sorry. It's more illust illustrative, so here it is. Yeah, um, of course, these uh, our, our, our findings are also biased towards uh, specific regions. Again, there is a dominance of, on the whole Arctic region, but particularly, I think that we uh, lack, um, lack answers from Oceanian region. So we had only 10 answers uh, from, from this particular region. Um, of course, if we, if we um, 
uh, observe the, the size of this region compared to some others. Uh, it also has to do uh, with the, it also plays an influence, but still um, I think that it would be good to have uh, more answers from this region. And, um, but uh, something that it's quite good, I think, is that we had um, fairly good representation uh, of answers coming from the neotropics, uh, which was uh, actually uh, higher than I was originally expecting. Thank you. Um, does anybody have a further question that they'd like to unmute or maybe put their hand up and ask because there's nothing in the chat at the moment? Maybe while we wait for that, um, I, I, was, I was wondering, you, you had the slide where you, you compared um, where things were decreasing or stable or um, you know things things like functional groups mm -hmm. um, yeah and I was wondering I was wondering that the decrease in functional groups were you able to kind of pinpoint it to particular regions where where that is a a major concern the, the decrease in functional groups mm -hmm. yeah uh, you, you mean on this slide yes 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 yeah. that one yeah uh, yeah functional um, diversity yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. Um, to, to be honest, I don't. We analyzed also separately. We, it's not part of the paper, but we checked separately, uh, separately um, finding th th these answers separately per taxon and and per biogeographic regions. Uh, but I on, honestly, I don't remember what was um, what was the most dominant region for this part. Um, we mainly uh, tried to, to focus on a portion of answers that were uh, contrastingly uh, contrast uh, to other answers. So to, to check what's the different. So we, we placed the focus on answers that uh, showed um, positive trends because uh, it was interesting uh, for us to see uh, if certain um, certain groups or cert certain regions are doing better than the average, uh, but but I don't uh, I don't remember this particular part. To be honest. Okay. No, thank you. Um, there's a comment in the chat saying, "Excellent presentation, Maria. Thank you." Um, thank you. Anybody who would like to unmute and ask another question of Maria? Uh, the, the feedback that you got, the, the responses, Maria. Um, the, the, the Google form you created, was that um, English O or? Okay multiple languages that may have uh, I, uh, I think that I understood what was your question because it was cut a bit uh, yeah for for Google uh, form uh, it was English only uh, we through through our uh, while we were distributing the query we actually uh, got a couple of comments uh, saying that it would be good to have uh, the form in, in uh, multiple languages. Uh, but because we already started uh, distributing the query in this form, we then didn't change it. But uh, definitely, we, we uh, took it uh, into consideration for uh, maybe for uh, some next study that is going to be conducted in this way, uh, that it would be good to, to uh, include additional languages. It's also um, when, when we were discussing bias, <laughs> Um, there is also uh, a great deal of literature that is non-English uh, that is, exists out there, and it also might be a um, um, valuable so source of information, but we somehow tend to overlook it. And we, we, we have bias towards English language. So that was, uh, that was presented uh, here in this study as well. Yeah, but definitely um, a good idea for the upcoming studies. 
Thank you, Johan. A, a great point about the literature of so much that is not in English and that we generally kind of just don't pay too much attention to. Yes. Um, so I don't have any other questions in the chat. So unless there is somebody who would like to unmute and, and ask a question, I think we can uh, probably wrap it up. Um, the message is coming in saying, great, great seminar, Maria. Thank you. Um, Thank from you. Jagoba, Malumbre, Olarte. Um, so, Maria, with that, um, thank you very much for a really interesting seminar today. Apologies about the um, technical glitches with connectivity. <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> thank um, you for inviting me. And uh, I, I know you don't just show up at these kind of things. So, so thank you also for the time that you spent in, in preparing for, for the seminar today. Um, it's really appreciated. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure. Um, and then... Thank you. And, and thank you also to, to the audience, um, the participants for, for the questions and, and the comments that you that you posted. Um, then just a reminder that you can visit the SEB Emerging Issues and Conservation page for a list of upcoming presentations um, every Wednesday during September. Um, and the October schedule should become available soon. So with that, thank you very much, everyone. And, and goodbye. Bye.